and welcome back to Story Collider's Stories of COVID-19 series. I'm your host, Erin Barker, and this is part one of episodes on the theme of community. Right now, while we can't safely gather together, community is harder than ever to create, at least in the ways that we're used to. But at the same time, it's also essential to our survival. We need to take care of each other, now more than ever. And we also need to feel connected and like we belong and like we're part of something bigger. When most of our interactions are through a computer screen, it's tough to support each other, celebrate special occasions, discover new experiences together, and inspire each other. But our stories in this episode will explore the ways in which our storytellers manage to do just that. And then we'll talk to Aaron Heller, a scientist who has studied the impact of new or novel experiences on our mental health. Our first story is from astrophysicist Emily Levesque. It was recorded at her home in Seattle. Comets. They're supposed to be harbingers of doom. We hear legends from all across the world telling us that when a comet appears, bad things are going to come with it. And that Kind of sounds pretty accurate these days. When the brightest comet in more than 20 years showed up this past July, it showed up in the midst of a viral pandemic, massive political upheaval. It was sharing the headlines with murder hornets. So it for sure sounds like comets should be synonymous with doom and gloom and horror. But this has never been how I see comets. I've never associated comets with fear or danger or bad things. Because in my life, comets have always brought me joy. I saw my first naked eye comet back when I was just two. In 1986, Halley's Comet made its last close flyby of the Earth. It does this about once every 75 years. And my big brother, Ben, was studying this comet for a school project. My whole family, so Ben, my parents, and toddler-sized me, went trooping out into our Massachusetts backyard to get a look. And according to my family, I was just over it. I was up past my bedtime. I was fussy, cold. I was scared of the dark until they pointed me up. And in that moment, I was just mesmerized by the sky above me. I was gaping up at the stars, trying to look through our little backyard telescope to see this comet. I was, of course, refusing to go indoors until Ben did. He's 10 years older than me, and my greatest little kid ambition, honestly, my greatest ambition even now, is to do everything just like Ben. But that night marked a sticking point for me and astronomy. As I'm getting older now, my family's encouraging me. I'm starting to devour books about astronomy. I'm watching science specials on PBS. I'm getting totally on board with being an astronomer one day, even though I have no idea what that job actually means. I figure I'm going to be solving the mysteries of the universe, and that sounds great, but I'm less clear on what my kind of cosmos exploring life is going to be like, and I'm specifically unsure of whether I'll be lonely. I love space, but will there be anyone there loving space with me? In my school, I'm the totally unapologetic, but also kind of frustrated geek, I don't have anyone else like me to share this passion for science with. I'm that kid watching squid documentaries on PBS while everyone else is watching Nickelodeon. Movies aren't really helping me out either because movie scientists' lives don't really look that great. Movie scientists are like the lone misunderstood geniuses that nobody wants to listen to right up until the volcano erupts or the dinosaurs start taking over the island. Women scientists seem to have an even tougher time in movies. They're lonely, they're tortured over having to choose between having a man and having a career. So I'm looking around thinking, okay, this is what I have to look forward to as a scientist? I think space is awesome, and I know there must be people out there who agree with me. So where are they? Where are the happy astronomers enjoying their jobs and doing them together? In 1994, I finally get a glimpse of what I'm looking for, and it's thanks to a comet. This is the year that a comet crashes into Jupiter, and the news is showing the first observations from the Hubble Space Telescope while I'm sitting at the dinner table. Now, we have an ancient little black and white TV sitting right on our table, 
But even with that fuzzy picture quality, I'm seeing Jupiter with this big, clear string of dark bruises from the comet impact. I remember gaping at the picture itself with like my fork halfway to my mouth and then seeing them cut to footage from Hubble's headquarters. There's a whole group of astronomers there. They're huddled around a few computer monitors. They're watching the raw images come in and they are psyched. They're packed shoulder to shoulder, just grinning and cheering. They're all being these super happy, geeky scientists and they're doing it together. So now watching them from my kitchen table on the little black and white TV, I wanna jump through the TV screen. I want to be part of seeing that Hubble data, and I want to be celebrating with all of my fellow space geeks. I want that to be me. This enthusiasm winds up becoming a key part of studying science for me. It propels me through college at MIT, where I'm really delighted to find my fellow super geeks. I start learning what professional astronomy is like. I start learning the ropes at world-class telescopes, and I start meeting the people who will become my colleagues. My first time working at a professional telescope is at Kitt Peak Observatory in Arizona, and this is after my sophomore year in college. I sit down at a whole dinner table full of astronomers, and when I get introduced as the new person, and when they find out that this is my first night at a telescope, all the astronomers immediately start telling me stories and sharing little bits of their lives and their misadventures at telescopes. They're telling me when I should drink coffee and plan snack breaks to help stay awake, what to do if clouds roll in or if something on the telescope breaks. They start telling me all these wild tales like bears wandering into observatory buildings or this epic story of a telescope that got shot. And all of this is giving me something beyond just professional tips and wacky stories. I'm sitting there going, I could listen to them all night because these are professional astronomers welcoming me, giving me another glimpse of what astronomy is like, and then telling me these stories from the observing I'm about to go do for the first time and this experience I'll be sharing with them. This kind of bonding is something I just love about astronomy. I love this draw that space has for people. The fact that when something like a solar eclipse happens, everyone does the same thing. They look up, they smile, they get curious, they ask questions about how things work. It's this great human bonding experience of being these intelligent creatures, sharing the same planet and the same sky, and just all wondering about something together. So this kind of shared experience is the thing that I have really most started to miss during COVID-19. Up until this year, you could pretty much guarantee that on any given evening around the world, telescopes all over the planet would be starting to open if the sky was clear, getting ready for a night of studying the universe with astronomers standing next to them watching the sun go down. And then during the pandemic, observatories all over the world have wound up closing due to safety concerns. Telescope time is really precious for an astronomer and normally keeping a working telescope closed for even one night is almost unthinkable. My colleagues and I all find out about these telescope closures in our email. And as the emails roll in, at first they're startling. How can we possibly close telescopes for more than a couple nights? Then they just start to feel inevitable or almost exhausting and almost unreal We're watching this slow creep of astronomy grinding to a halt across our entire planet. And the idea that telescopes across the globe are closed for months is hard to fathom. I start to feel almost unmoored hearing this news. Global astronomy and worldwide stargazing has just been a constant for me. We'll always be looking up, we'll always be enjoying the beauty of the sky, and we'll always be using these beautiful telescopes to answer our questions. And all that has suddenly stopped. It's unbelievable to me that it even can stop. It's also hard in all of this to gauge where my friends and family and my colleagues are, even emotionally, from day to day. There's an avalanche of absurd news coming at us every day, And from moment to moment, it can leave one person encouraged or another person just enraged and another person numb or just unwilling to take in any more news at all. The thread of common experience and emotion and reactions has started to feel like it's slipping away. 
And astronomy itself is really fading into the background as I watch all of this. When I look around, people don't seem like they need what I do anymore. I study the physics of how stars work, how the most massive stars in the universe age and then die and make supernovae and black holes. Normally, this is so cool, but it starts to feel useless amid everything that's going on. People don't need the physics of stars. They need doctors and vaccine research and child care. They need help to just keep going in their day-to-day lives. And it makes me start to feel a little useless. Does astronomy even matter anymore? It can't keep people fed. It can't keep them healthy or safe. What does what I do have to offer to people? I start getting an answer on my walks through my neighborhood. The local shops around here have all been boarded up as they lose customers. And people are now covering the plywood with art or poetry or block long murals. Kids are leaving chalk sketches on sidewalks. They're taping up drawings in their windows and leaving stuffed animals in their windows for people to spot on their walks. One of my neighbors is a retired opera singer and he's giving nightly concerts from his backyard. Art is usually the first thing to lose funding. It's the first thing we see as frivolous or non-essential. And walking around seeing how quickly people brought beauty to our neighborhood starts driving home to me how important art is to people and how valuable that beauty is. When it seems like the world is shutting down, art is the first thing people seem to need. And creating something that brings joy or beauty is the first thing they turn to to try and share their feelings and share their experiences. Astronomy has always felt a bit like the art or the music of science. Its appeal is partly in its beauty. It's in the fact that it's bigger than us, and it's in the fact that it's shared. So in early July, in the midst of pandemic news and political news and the just daily disasters that we were getting hit with, a comet suddenly starts making headlines all over the world. It's becoming hard to miss in the northern sky when you look up. I actually see it for the first time almost by accident. I spot it from my driveway in Seattle, and I run into the house and practically drag my husband out into the street at like 11 p.m. to take a look at it. I'm suddenly excited to look at the sky again. I'm jumping around the street in pajamas, and I'm getting this sudden thrill of seeing a comet with my own eyes. To get a better look at it, We wind up driving out to this shadowy park nearby to try and get a really good look. And even during a time when we're all supposed to be avoiding each other, I'm delighted to get to this park and see people, to see that we're not alone. There's little clusters of people all over the park. They're all wearing masks. They're all in socially distant groups, but everyone's pointed in the same direction. Everyone's pointing their eyes or their binoculars or their phones at one patch of sky. I know all those phone photos are headed for the internet. I'm getting photos in my text messages from my brother in Massachusetts because he has two teenagers now and they're all looking at the comet in their yard. And it immediately feels like one big group suddenly sharing something again for the first time. The comets captured an entire hemisphere's curiosity. And in this little park, everybody's wandering across the grass and kind of ducking under trees and blocking out streetlights. Everyone's finally pointed upward and standing together to try and get a look at this little neighbor in our solar system that's just dropped by for a visit. It gives me the surprising and beautiful moment of togetherness. Everyone in the park with me is living through a pandemic. But everyone in the park with me is also looking at a comet. They're whispering to each other about it. They're trying to, you know, stand in the right patch of shadow to get the best possible look. The pandemic has hit all of us on a truly global scale. And it's really given people this shared experience through tragedy and through all sorts of loss. To me, what makes astronomy so precious right now and so important right now is the thing that comets have given me for more than 30 years and the thing that we all shared in the park that night. Astronomy can offer humanity this same unity and this same shared experience through joy and through triumph and through beauty. 
That night in the park looking at the comet was a shot of pure energy. Seeing the comet itself was incredible, but seeing it with the collection of people, even total strangers all standing six feet apart, was an invaluable moment of feeling just a little less alone. That was Emily Levesque. Emily is an award-winning astrophysicist and professor at the University of Washington in Seattle, who studies how the most massive stars in the universe evolve and die. She has observed for upward of 50 nights on many of the planet's largest telescopes and flown over the Antarctic stratosphere in an experimental aircraft for her research. She is the author of the popular science book The Last Stargazers, which shares the stories and adventures of life as a professional astronomer. What's the best way to learn a new language? Immersion. But sometimes that's not in the cards. But you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Now, I might only be one week into learning German with Babbel, but I'm so excited to start being able to speak German with my mom. With Babbel, you can learn everything you need to have real-world conversations, and all it takes is just 10 minutes a day. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college, which is bonkers. But Babbel is conversation-based learning with science-backed cognitive tools like spaced repetition and interactive lessons created by real language teachers and voiced by real native speakers. So here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com story. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash story. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash story. Rules and restrictions may apply. Before we move on to our interview segment, I want to give a quick reminder that you can catch more true personal stories about science at our online live shows. Find out more about that at storycliter.org. This week, we have a local show featuring Chicago storytellers. And at the end of the month, we're going to have a local show featuring Boston storytellers. So Chicago and Boston listeners, be sure to check those out. Next week, we have our January Story Slam. So if you are interested in taking the Story Collider stage or screen, as it were, yourself, join us for that slam. Put your name in the virtual hat. You may get invited on screen to share your story. It's super fun. We have so much fun at these slams. And now feels like a good time to mention that if you're listening to the series thinking that you have a story about how the pandemic has affected you in a big or small way, get in touch. You can send your story pitches to stories at storycliter.org, or you can pitch through the form on our website. We are continuing to look for COVID-19 stories. We're going to continue to gather these. We may return to our usual types of stories sometime soon, non-COVID-19 specific related stories, just to give everybody a break. Let us know if you have thoughts about that. If you would like to hear stories that are non-COVID-19 related for a while, send me an email, Aaron at storycliter.org. I'd love to hear your thoughts about it or tweet at us or comment on Facebook. We'd love to hear more about what you'd like to hear on this podcast. In the meantime, Emily's story got me thinking about how much I miss communal experiences, spontaneous experiences, or just special experiences that are outside the everyday routine. So I was excited to talk to Aaron Heller. Aaron is a clinical psychologist and effective neuroscientist at the University of Miami who has studied the impact of new or novel experiences on our mental health. Welcome to the podcast, Aaron. Do you want to tell me a little bit about this study, how you conducted it? Sure. Thanks for having me, Aaron. So um, the kind of genesis of the idea happened when I was a postdoc in New York, and Dr. Hartley and I were working in the same lab together and talking about using mobile technology to you know, understand people's behaviors and how it related to their emotion, and particularly their behaviors and emotions that they went about their daily life. And at the time, a paper had just come out showing that genetically identical mice, um, when placed in a cage, uh, like an environmentally enriched cage, um, showed kind of strikingly different patterns of exploration. So even though they were genetically identical, some ended up exploring much more of the cage and others kind of 
stuck to their corner of the cage, so to speak. And there were some brain differences that seemed to happen as a result of exploration, and um, especially in the hippocampus. And, um, and they operationalized their metric of exploration using this idea of roaming entropy, which is basically the idea of how much, how you distribute your time over space. So if you spend all of your time in, let's say, two locations, work and home, um, or two parts of a cage, then roaming entropy is relatively low. Whereas if you distribute your time evenly over a bunch of locations, entropy, your roaming entropy goes up and up and up. And so, you know, um, mobile technology and smartphones were becoming more and more ubiquitous. This is now six, seven years ago. And so we started constructing the idea of how we might be able to do this in human subjects. And so we started in New York and then I moved to Miami and we continued data collection both in New York and Miami, where we just simply asked the question of whether this, this uh, measure of roaming entropy in humans was related to daily var variation in positive or negative emotion. And so in order to do that, we um, brought people into the lab, downloaded a GPS uh, tracking application onto their phones, got their phone number, and over the course of between three and four months, the subsequent or ensuing three to four months, we just tracked them passively so they didn't have to do anything. And then in addition to that, every other day, we texted them, uh, asking them to fill out a brief survey relating to how they were feeling in the moment. How, what were their levels of positive emotion? What were their levels of negative emotion? Um, and that was the genesis of the idea, really, was that paper that came out in Science by, um, by Freund and colleagues. And really, we were interested in testing whether or not these same kind of concepts um, generalized to humans using mobile technology. Yeah, so what correlations did you find between how much people roamed and, and how they were responding to your survey? Yeah, so what we found was that on days in which an individual displayed um, more roaming or higher roaming entropy, in essence, a, um, a measure of exploration, so to speak, they reported higher levels of positive emotion. And this effect was interestingly specific to positive emotion. So the effect was not significant there for negative emotion. It was in the expected direction such that greater exploration or greater roaming was associated with lower negative emotion, but the effect was um, quite a bit smaller actually. And so, um, and so what was interesting about this is that this was a, what you might call um, like a within person effect. So, for each of us, even though we may have different average levels of exploration, someone may, you know, run all over the place all day and someone may just kind of be more of a homebody. Um, for each of us on days on which we explore more, we tend to report higher levels of positive emotion. And that was like the kind of crux of the central finding of, this, of the paper, of the study. And, and we went about trying to extend this or expand this in a variety of ways. So one way that we tried to do that was to like um, explore whether going to what we call novel locations might be um, a potential driver or more specific feature of this relationship between exploring and positive emotion. And so what we did was we basically took the entire sampling period for each person and we asked um, for that location that you are in right now, that latitude and longitude coordinate, uh, had you ever been there before in the recording period? You know, because we spend most of our time in a real, relatively select number of locations, you know, home, work, maybe the one or two grocery stores we may go to, maybe a friend's place, something like that. But, but beyond that, we can explore places that we may have never been to before or places that we rarely go to. And so we operationalized these novel locations as places that we had never, the participant had never visited in the recording period. And we found even stronger effects, actually. So that on days that when an individual went to um, a greater number of, quote, novel locations or spent more time in novel locations, 
um, the effect size was even larger with positive emotion. So that that seemed to be that novelty was another piece of the puzzle, so to speak, right? It wasn't just exploring. It was also exploring places that you maybe had never been to before, at least in our recording period, or had never been to before, you know, or had never been to in quite some time. Um, so that was another piece. And then we extended this in a kind of third way with uh, where we basically used each location, each latitude, longitude coordinate, and back translated that into to the Census Bureau. And from that, we were able to download from block groups, so kind of these geographic entities on which uh, the United States tracks demog- socio-demographic information, like you know, median age of um, resident and median income and, and typical education level and proximity to supermarkets and et cetera, et cetera, right? And so we, we kind of back projected our uh, latitude on shoot into the census data to download a variety of these sociodemographic variables for each location, for each block group. And we essentially calculated this measure of entropy, this measure of exploration, not in not in geographic space, but we calculated it in sociodemographic space. So the idea is, if you're in your, if you're in New York City and and you roam a lot, but let's say you just roam a lot in Midtown Manhattan, that's a very different psychological experience than going from Midtown Manhattan to the Bronx to Queens to um, to Staten Island, etc. Even if the distance you travel is the same, even if your distribution of locations over time is the same. So roaming entropy could be identical, but the time you're spending in different sociodemographic spaces may be quite different. And so we use Wow, those- this is some CSI stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we um, it was really, really cool. I learned so much in this process about um about uh, GIS systems, geoinformatic systems. I learned so much about um, what our Census Bureau collects and the resolution at which we collect it. Um, and also kind of the, the, the spatial diversity of Miami and New York, you know. So mm-hmm. in Miami, for example, um, you know, the population density is obviously way lower than in Manhattan or Brooklyn or whatever. Um, and so when you look at maps of the sociodemographic space, you know, parts of Miami are quite homogeneous, right? Um, so where the University of Miami is at in Coral Gables, it's fairly um, homogenous in a, in a sociodemographic way, right? Whereas in New York, you don't have to travel as far to increase, to go to a, what might be considered a different sociodemographic space. Um, nonetheless, there's actually a lot of diversity in Miami, but that's another story for another time. But, <laughs> but, um, what I'll just say to kind of wrap up that piece is that, um, exploration or roaming entropy in this sociodemographic space was also strongly related to, um, your level of positive emotion on that day. So it, so there were kind of three main features. One is general roaming or exploration Two is the degree to which you explore new locations, places that you hadn't been to, was even more strongly associated with your reporting of positive emotion. And then three, um, an additional feature of this may be the degree to which you explore um, different kinds of spaces, different kinds of spaces as defined by their sociodemographic features. Cool. So what do you think all of this means for our mental health? Um, I mean, so at the front end, I just want to say that this, these data are completely correlational. So it's hard to infer causal relationships when we're just sampling positive emotion and sampling movement. Um, so we're not inducing positive emotion. It could be just that you feel good. So you explore more, or it could be that you explore more. So you feel good. Right. So we don't necessarily know for sure that, the roaming and the new locations that that causes us to feel better. But we just know that it's associated with those better feelings. That's right. For sure. I think that that's a really important point um, that uh, just that the kind of limitations of this really observational kind of study um, allow us to make. 
That being said, I do think COVID has been um, a, an opportunity for all of us to have experiences like this. <laughs> little bit of anecdotal evidence. <laughs> yeah, personal anecdotal evidence, exactly. Um, that having diverse experiences, um, you know, is really relevant to, to emotional well-being. And whether you kind of anticipate kind of feeling good, you know, I live in Miami, so going on walks on the beach, right? Um, there are a diverse set of inputs that I experience, you know, the, the ocean, the trees, the blue sky, all this kind of stuff. And so um, whether my mood perks up in part because I'm anticipating that and or whether it perks up because I'm experiencing that like in real time, um, in some way, I would say doesn't really matter, actually. Um, but it does suggest that there is uh, at least a bi-directional relationship between new and diverse experiences and um, my emotional well-being in the moment. What does that mean, bi-directional? That uh, my mood could cause me to explore more and or the exploration could cause my mood to improve. Ah, gotcha. So I think you did another phase of this study, right, where you scanned people's brains? Yeah. So at the end of the tracking period that we were just talking about, um, we brought a, uh, a subset of those participants back to the lab, both in New York and in Miami. And we scanned them using um, a resting state a design where essentially they come into the lab and they lay in a functional MRI machine where we record um blood flow, brain activity, and um, for 15 or so minutes. And that's it, right? They come in, we just record their baseline levels of activity. They can think about whatever they want. Um, They just can't obviously move around. And we record brain activity continuously for 15 minutes. And so one of the um, kind of key questions that we had going into linking the, the mobile data with the brain imaging data was um, where do individual differences in the degree to which my exploration is linked to my emotional well-being, where are those kind of grounded in the brain? So let me just unpack that a little bit. So even though overall we saw this quite robust effect where um, exploration or roaming was associated with positive mood, it wasn't, the magnitude wasn't the same in everybody. So for one person, exploration might have been more strongly associated with positive mood than another person. So you could think of it that we don't all, we're not all the same in our sensitivity, our emotional sensitivity to exploration. So that is an individual difference that we share, that somebody may be more impacted by exploration than another person. And so that, was, that, that feature is really what we were trying to link to, to the brain. And so to go back to the, the Freund paper that I started this, um, this conversation with the mice exactly, that um, what they found there was that um, those rodents who explored more who showed greater roaming entropy, also displayed greater uh, neurogenesis, so greater rates of new neuron growth in the hippocampus. So the experience of novelty, the experience of having more diverse experiences in these rodents were linked to just more new neuronal growth in the hippocampus. What's the significance of that being in the hippocampus as opposed to other parts of the brain? Yeah, it's a great question. And there's large literatures now that seem to suggest that um, the rate of hippocampal neurogenesis is associated with um, better better stress regulation. Um, Rodents who play more or who are exercising more um, have higher rates of hippocampal neurogenesis. Um, If you subject a rodent to... Um, inescapable or unavoidable stress. So you shock it or you put it in the presence of a predator that it can't escape. Uh, Rates of hippocampal neurogenesis go down. Um, So it's thought to be a marker of stress-related disorders like depression, for example. 
you know, it's thought to be important for memory formation. So there are multiple domains in which hippocampal neurogenesis appears to be really important uh, in rodents. It's debated somewhat where whether um, uh, the same kind of hippocampal neurogenesis occurs in humans, but there is some uh, pretty good evidence that actually it, it does exist in primates as well. So just that is all to say that this Freund paper using the rodents found that um, those rodents who explored more, despite being genetically identical, showed higher rates of hippocampal neurogenesis. And so we kind of, we obviously can't measure hippocampal neurogenesis in humans, in our, in our participants, but we can look at the, the kind of integrity or strength of um, connectivity in the brain related to reward and, um, and the hippocampus. And so we kind of targeted a circuit of the brain that included the, um, the ventral striatum or nucleus accumbens, so an area of the brain that is known to be res- important for um, reward learning, um, often the subjective experience of positive emotion, so reward kind of broadly defined, and the hippocampus. And these two regions have are directly connected with one another. And so we specifically tested whether um, those individuals whose positive emotion was more sensitive to exploration in their daily life were also those individuals who displayed greater connectivity between those two regions, between the hippocampus and, and the um, nucleus accumbens. And that's, that's what we saw, actually, that those individuals um, who were uh, more impacted by, by their exploration, whose positive mood was more impacted by their exploration, showed um, greater strength or greater coupling between the hippocampus and nucleus accumbens. So right now, during the pandemic, a lot of us are not having very new or varied experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, what advice would you give us based on everything that you've learned? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, diverse and new experiences can happen in a variety of ways. So while um, geographic exploration is obviously one great way to do it and the way in which we pretty much uh, measured it in in this study, I think that there are a variety of ways to um, do that if you're unable to kind of explore um, as, as diverse or as many locations. Uh, so that can include different types of exercise, doing yoga or meditation, you know, trying, I don't know, cooking new recipes, um, you know, talking to people maybe that you haven't spoken to in a while. So I think to me, and this remains to be really tested, but there are a variety of ways to increase your um, the diversity of your experiences in a day. And in terms of like how this might generalize, um, I might kind of think in those terms. Gotcha. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Heller, for taking the time to chat with us today. Thanks for having me. The Story Collider is so grateful to Aaron for sharing his knowledge and to Emily for sharing her story. The Story Collider is also very grateful for the support of Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. This podcast series is produced by me, Aaron Barker with assistance from Story Collider's Deputy Director Nissa Greenberg and Senior Podcast Editor Jun Chen. Special thanks goes out to Story Collider's board, our Operations Manager Lindsay Cooper, and our Interim Executive Director Leslie Griesbach-Schultz, without whom none of this would be possible. The story featured in the first part of this episode was produced by Misha Gajewski. The theme music is by Eva Gertz of the Fulton Street Music Group. Stay tuned for two more stories in Part 2 of Community on Monday. Until then, this is Story Collider signing off. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask, love each other. Thanks for listening. <laughs>